Good evening, and welcome to University Presbyterian Church's Lenten series. Tonight we have the pleasure of talking to the Reverend Dr. Esau Macaulay, who's a canon in the Episcopal Church. He has served a number of churches around the world. He has a PhD from St. Andrews University, where he studied with N.T. Wright. He's a Pauline scholar. He's written two works. His first book is called Sharing in the Son's Inheritance, published by T.T. Clark. He has a second book coming out this fall called Reading While Black, and he's in the process of uh, editing a forthcoming multi-ethnic commentary called The New Testament in Color. It covers a diverse group of scholars committed to the great tradition who can address the relevance of biblical texts to their communities. He's also written popular pieces for numerous outlets, including Christianity Today and The Witness, a black Christian collective. Dr. McCauley currently serves as assistant professor of New Testament at Wheaton College in Wheaton, Illinois. He's the co-founder of the Call and Response Conference, and uh, he is the director of Next Generation Leadership for the ACNA, the Anglican Church in North America. So it's our pleasure to have you, Dr. McCauley. We're glad you're here. Thank you all for having me. Uh, I appreciate it. So Dr. McCauley is speaking to us from his home in Wheaton, Illinois. We had planned to have him here because of the COVID experience. He wisely has decided to stay home and be, speak yes. with us electronically. But I wanted to begin, Dr. McCauley, with just asking you uh, this question. In the midst of the COVID-19 crisis, where isolation is really becoming our experience, the questions of identity are really important, and what does it mean to be, uh, for us to be whole people? And I wonder if you could speak just generally to begin with on what it, where do we find our identity and how do we maintain our identity in the midst of this kind of crisis? Yeah, I think identity is one of those words where people can fill it in with whatever they, they want. It's, it's kind of an easily an agenda-laden term. And I think that for the Christian, we find our identity in Christ. Paul talks about Jesus as the second Adam. And the, in, the interesting thing about Jesus as the second Adam, he's in, in some sense a new beginning to creation. So what does it mean to be fully human? It, it, part of it means is to be like Jesus. But the interesting thing about Jesus as the second Adam is that he's actually, and this is where kind of like, if you think of the matrix, if you think about the fact that Jesus as the second Adam was also, but we're also made in his image. The first Adam was. So even though Jesus is the second Adam, the first Adam was made according to his likeness. So there's a sense in which all of humanity was created to eventually reflect the image of the sun. And so I would say the Christian finds their identity in Jesus which actually has um, some interesting implications for our gospels that we have. So if the purpose of, of finding our identity is to become like Jesus, then reading the gospels becomes the means by which we encounter the living God because the gospels tell us about Jesus. So the gospels begin to tell us what it means to live a good life. So if we were to maintain our identity or encourage our identity in these kinds of stressful times, how do we do that? And this is, this, is, this is the interesting thing. It is to read the Gospels. And that may be, I'm sorry to disappoint you all to say like, <laughs> read your Bibles. Um, but and let, me give, let me give you one example. One of, one of the key things we're trying to figure out is how do we maintain who we are in the midst of everything changing, remaining, and, and, you know, the world seeming upside down, and even some people in great, under great suffering. But what you read, if you read the Gospels, is you read Jesus maintaining his personal integrity in the midst of constant accusation, misunderstanding, and supreme suffering. So what does it look like to, have, to live faithfully under trial? We read the passion narratives, right? Mm. Or we have this sense in which there are certain things that we're entitled to, certain experiences and freedoms, and kind of uh, all of the things that come with living a middle-class Western lifestyle. We think this is what it means to live a good life. But the Beatitudes present a much different picture of the people who are blessed and favored by God. And so the very act of reading and believing these biblical texts challenge some of the fundamental assumptions by which our culture operates. And one of the things that, that, that COVID is actually exposing is this, this deep need that we all have for community. Hmm. I mean, how often have we taken church for granted? And, and I want to understand this. COVID is a tragedy in which people are suffering and people are losing their lives. 
What I'm talking about is a theological reflection of what these tragedies teach us, like any tragedy teaches us things. Mm. And one of the things that the Christian has always said is that it's not good for man to be alone. And that, that idea that it's not good for a person to be alone is not simply limited to couples in sexual relationship, but the fact that human beings are people made for community. And we've said over and over again, it's important for us to gather. And we put almost everything we can imagine ahead of gap, this, the simple good of gathering as community. And now that that's been taken away from us, we're starting to realize how much we're not simply Facebook and Twitter avatars, we're real human beings. Yeah, that's great. Just a reminder for those who are listening, that we want to, you can type your questions on the chat room for YouTube, and we'll pose those questions to Dr. McCauley as we go along. When light of that need for community and identity raises the question then, as we look at ourselves in the mirror, how does, much, how does uh, what we see in the mirror impact our identity? So the question really is about ethnicity and heritage. How much is that a part of our identity, and how much does it matter? Well, there's two... Um mistakes that you can make in this regard. One is to have kind of this colorblind theology where we say, well, I don't see ethnicity and I don't see race because we're all united in Christ. There's neither Jew nor Greek, male nor female. There's no slave, there's no slavery free. We're all one in Christ. And so this idea that the gospel eliminates ethnic difference. And the other error is to place such a high emphasis on an ethnic identity that Christ isn't allowed to critique every culture. And so what I want to say is that the Bible, and we could kind of talk about this more later, but the Bible in places like Revelation 7, 9, talks about every tribe, tongue, and nation. That's every ethnicity, every people group, and every language are going to worship God before his throne in the new creation. But, and that means, this is important, that means the language and ethnicity are eschatological, that they endure past the resurrection. So we're not all resurrected and become like the Borg. Like we're not all resurrected as blonde Norwegian, you know, people who are <laughs> six foot two and six packs. But, but our ethnicity endures. But the other thing that's important about this is that, is that language encodes culture. And so you, if you, anyone who speaks more than one language, especially a, a non-native speaker to, who doesn't speak English, who may say, you know what, we have this saying in Spanish or in, or in French, and it doesn't come across quite as clearly in English. Something is lost in the translation process. There's something about the culture and the language that manifests something essential that you can't just transfer from one to the other. And what I wanna say then is that if language endures for eternity, then those cultural particularities endure, endure for eternity. And so God needs me glorifying him as my free black Christian self. Now, the other part about that though, is that every single culture is in some sense critiqued in different ways by the gospel. And so what I wanna say is that Jesus says yes and no to every culture in the world. There's certain things about our culture, that, for any culture, that makes us um, hear the gospel in a particular way. And there's certain kind of sinfulness and brokenness in every culture in which God says these things need to change. And so it's never the case where we can simply say, well, this is my culture, therefore I can't be critiqued. Hmm. And one of the great things, can I say more about this? Please. <laughs> One of the great things about the scriptures is the scriptures gives us a common, a common language by which to analyze our culture. Otherwise, it becomes a series of assertions of power, right? I like black culture and I don't like, you know, country music. So I can say, you know what? Country music is the worst. But this is the assertion of my culture on your culture. But if we're all equally submitted to the scriptures, then we can say, in what way is God challenging each of us? our own cultural limitations and cultural baggage. And so the scriptures, I think, as a supreme authority, allow for community to develop across difference with some kind of standard to arbitrate, because otherwise it's an assertion of power. And this is what happens with colonialization, right? Where it's not simply evangelization, it's that they need to be evangelized and become Western. Hmm. But it's the scriptures that critique that. And so I think that we need to have a strong affirmation of, uh, of the goodness of our ethnic differences while understanding that we are critiqued by the gospel. So what do you say to people who would say to you, well, I don't feel like I have any culture, or I don't know what my ethnicity is, which you often hear from dominant culture people? Well, it's a manifestation of privilege, right? Because they think that what they do is normal. 
<laughs> and so when you say like, I don't have a culture, I say, trust me, when I come into your church, it feels super white. <laughs> it's a culture. Let me give you an example of this. Let me give you an example of this. So when there is, at least in kind of, I'll speak bluntly and say a lot of white church context. They think, well, okay, we need to be more informal, but that's more evangelistically effective, right? So we'll go from hymns with West in the Anglican context with Wesley um, and other people, and we'll go from that to contemporary praise and worship. A lot of churches do this. A lot of churches have maybe a traditional service, a contemporary service. Do you all have that? Yes. Or okay. So here's the thing: both those churches, both of those services are different manifestations of white culture. Neither one of those are black. It is formal white culture and informal white culture. Neither one of those things are actually black gospel music. And so to, to say that I don't have a culture doesn't take into a fact that like when I come into a contemporary service, I hear 70 soft rock. It's what I hear, right? I don't hear this is a more informal, inviting place. And this is no shot for 70 soft rock. I'm not saying it's a bad form of music, but it's a culture yeah. and it comes from a context. And to say that I don't have a context means to say that you don't have norms by which you live your life. And everybody does it. And what happens is those norms become just normal. And so when you talk about um, something like music, music encodes culture. Mm -hmm. Food um, encodes culture. Patterns of speech encode culture. Humor. I mean, what, even preaching styles, right? So we think that you know, that the proper way to preach may be this reserved three points, a witty introduction, maybe a poem, maybe a quote from the New York Times. That's a culturally encoded way of communication, which isn't bad, right? It's not like that this is inferior and then what black churches do is superior, but there's, there's encoded cultural norms. And so one of the things that I would say is someone who doesn't, who don't think they have a culture, it's like go to a different culture and look at all of the things you notice, you notice is different. <laughs> and all the things you notice are different are your culture, right? And so if you go into a black church and everything feels different, then you begin to understand how someone feels when they come to your space. Yeah. And that actually is very important because it allows you to develop, well, how can we be hospitable as a church? How can we actually not simply this, I'm gonna get in trouble, but you guys are already invited me here. Not can we, not can, and this is what happens a lot, especially in majority white churches. The argument is about which segment of white America they want to evangelize, not actually diversity. So if they feel like, you know what, we love people who listen to NPR and who are center left politically or center right politically. So that's the group that we want to evangelize. And so diversity just means adopting a even a political value towards diversity that speaks to a certain segment of white America, but doesn't actually speak to African-Americans. And so what I wanna say then is that you have, everyone has a culture and that culture in fact impacts a, a variety of decisions. And even the, the value of certain kinds of diversity is a manifestation of a certain segment of white culture. It's not actually an embrace of multi-ethnicity. So it sounds to me like you're saying that to be a disciple of Jesus, you have to understand something about your own culture to understand how it's both influencing the way you follow and how you engage other people in the world. Yes, I mean, Jesus, I mean, okay. When God wanted to teach his people, he wanted to form him. If you think of the Old Testament as, as a tool of discipleship, he regulated their food. He gave, them, he, he gave them a calendar by which they lived their lives and he gave them rituals to do over and over and over again. He gave them a culture. And you can't understand Jesus apart from understanding the fact that he came into a Jewish culture. Now what makes a Jewish culture unique is that it's kind of, it's given to them as a gift of God. But in the same way that you can't understand Jesus apart from his Jewish context, you can't understand me apart from the fact that I grew up in the American South in the shadow of Jim Crow. I'm from Alabama and I grew up in the Black Baptist Church. I came into evangelicalism and its wider cultural ethos through um, a mainline kind of Protestant tradition. And now I exist that we in college as someone who's both a child of the Black church, who's been in evangelicalism and who knows the mainline tradition. Now you can't understand anything that I say outside of that context. And so one of the things that makes people, it's hard to be a disciple 
is unless you understand the real ways in which your culture is shaping you and is shaping how you hear and respond to the text. And that you're not coming to the text as this unbiased reader, but you're shaped by a thousand different decisions, some of which you've made and some of which have been made for you. So it sounds to me like part of what you're describing as discipleship is a journey that takes you out of your culture, places you in kingdom culture, so you don't really fit anywhere in a sense. Yeah, I would say that like um, part, and this is the goodness of God. God still speaks in the midst of the fact, in the midst of our varied compromised cultures. And so I don't think that anyone ever leaves their culture in the purest sense of the word. Like, I don't know. I mean, you could fall in love with Jesus and still love soft rock and still love like, you know, whatever, you know, German food is. Maybe you still like bank. So I'm from, I was in Scotland. You, uh, I don't think when you become a Christian in Scotland, you stop eating bangers and mats, right? Those things persist. But what it does is that our cultures give us, a, there's a real danger. And I'll say this, maybe this help you get it, what I'm trying to say. There are more people who are, who are confident in the infallibility, the, the infallibility of the social consensus of their culture than have confidence in the scriptures. Mm. And our culture gives us a series of values and ideas and customs that we think are true and natural and good. And because everybody around us shares those views, it becomes obvious. And, and what Jesus does is he breaks through that and he's actually speaking a word to your culture. And so you're able to not necessarily leave your culture, but to see it with a critical eye. Mm. And so I exist as a part of African-American culture. And part of that means I think of black as beautiful and good, but it doesn't mean that there aren't parts of my culture that, that are above critique. And part of being a Christian is to say, blackness is not infallible. Like the black social consensus is not infallible. And so I'm able to sometimes break with my culture and say the gospel here, um, is calling my culture to account. Hmm. Or I can say, the way that my culture has received the gospel helps clear up a blind spot that may exist from the majority culture. So for example, there's this strong divide in kind of white churches between social action and theological orthodoxy. And we tend to pull these things apart. We tend to think that, you know, there either can be a church that is strong on social action or strong on doctrine. But because the black church was born in the context of slavery, from the beginning, the black church is politically active, right? We, we protest established law. But at the same time, the black church has remained historically, relatively theologically traditional. And so this bifurcation exists in, in, in this long battle between kind of evangelicalism and the progressive tradition that, that sometimes divides these two things. Well, coming from the African-American context, I don't feel that same tension. And so I'm able to say, because of my culture's experience of the gospel, we have a word of critique sometimes to the white church to say, the things that you all pull apart, we keep together. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean that everything that the black church does is correct, but that's one place where I think that our cultural context helps us hear the gospel. I could say more. I don't want to like just ramble on, but I, can, I, can I talk about this one? Sure. Um, I, I'm reading, um, um, I think it's Justo Gonzalez. Yeah. Um, and he wrote this book called Manana, and I'm That's reading it because I'm lecturing on, on Latino theology. And he had this great point. He said that um, being a, a Latino means that like, he has no illusions about their history, that part of the Spanish conquest of um, South America was like the rape and assault of the indigenous people there. And so there's no illusions that our people were the heroes. And so we have this real sense of like, having what you call a non-innocent reading of our history, that we're able to tell the truth about what happened. And that allows them to read the Bible and to see that, you know, there are characters in the Bible who did things that we don't need to affirm. Like Abraham shouldn't have had multiple kids, multiple wives, right? These kinds of things. And he says that one of the problems with America is they still think they have an innocent reading of their history. Mm. And as Americans, we tend to downplay the sinfulness of our founding fathers and try to downplay their sin and, and kind of lift up their, their heroicism because we kind of have a still an innocent reading of history. And so he says being a Latina or Latino in this non-innocent reading of history allows him to come to the Bible with kind of an unvarnished eye about the figures of biblical characters. And he says one of the things that he noticed when he came to America 
is how often things like, oh, yeah, David kind of sexually assaulted Bathsheba, but he was a man after God's own heart, right? So we, we, we tend to do this move instead of really embracing the fact that the hero of the Bible are not the characters. The hero is God. And then you're able to say, no, David committed a tremendous sin here. It had long-term implications in the biblical text themselves for his generations. And so he talks about how that his location as being Latino and a non-innocent reading of his own history allowed him to read the Bible. And, and so what I want to say then is that each culture, our history, our formation, our background, shapes the way we read these texts. And we need each other to read the Bible properly. So we have a couple of questions coming in that are asking, um, what, so should we value diversity? What might a diverse ch uh, church look and sound like? And should we be working towards a multicultural experience in church or celebrating different cultures of different churches? Well, I want to say it depends on if you want to be biblical. If you want to be biblical, then we have to value like multi, multi ethnicity. And I don't want to, I want to see if I can do this quickly. The, all of the stuff that we talk about as relates to the mission of the church. So, um, like Genesis 12, let's pick up Genesis 12, where God says to Abraham, in you, all the nations of the world will be blessed. I'm going to change the name from Abram to Abraham. You'll be the father of many nations. And so from the beginning, the energy of the Bible picks up its steam. The story of God's people kind of takes off like a rocket at the moment where God says, this story is not about you. It's about everybody else. Then if you get to the promise, to promises made to David, the King David, God says, I'm going to make, I'm going to choose you and your offspring and you're going to rule over Israel. But that vision is not limited to Israel. You can see in places like Psalm 72, where it says that you're going to rule over the entire world. And then it says this, it says of the son of David, all the nations of the world will be blessed by, by you. And so what the psalmist is saying is the promises that God made to Abraham will be fulfilled in and through the person of the king who through his gracious rule is going to bless the nations. So when you get to the New Testament, in, in the Bible begins, Matthew, right? Jesus Christ, son of David, son of Abraham, the beginning of the genealogy. The point is this, to say that the promises that God made about blessing the nations of the world are being fulfilled in and through Jesus. And so the ministry of Jesus then is seen as the means by which God blesses everybody. That's why in the genealogy of Matthew, you have the four foreign women to show that the God's gospel includes everyone. The Great Commission, right? It says, go and make disciples of all nations and teaching them to obey everything that I've taught you. So he's saying this good news about who I am that I've, that I've described in the gospels, go and tell everybody. You get to the book of Acts. You get to the book of Acts. What is Pentecost? The gospel is for everybody. You get to Paul's letters. You get to Paul's letters. And it would have been super easy. Paul to say, you know what? We're going to have two services. We're going to have a Jewish service on at 9 o'clock. We're going to have a Gentile service at 11 o'clock. Nobody has to eat together. Everybody tithes. Things are great. No, Paul doesn't do that. He said there's something essential about the gospel that is lost if we're not together. We think about justification by faith as this means by which we get saved, which is true. I'm not denying that. Don't come for me, Presbyterians. But how does justification by faith actually function in Paul's letters? Like what rhetorical function does it play as he's making this argument? Justification by faith serves to keep the Jewish and the Gentile Christians together. It functions in his rhetoric to sustain multi-ethnic churches. Paul says stuff like this when he says, or is God the God of the Jews only? No, he's the God of the Jews and the Gentiles. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. The affirmation of oneness is only important in so much as it talks about diversity becoming one. Now, I could go on and talk about Revelation and, and the other letters, but the point is made that the Bible itself, from Genesis to Revelation, speaks of God's desire to reconcile all things to himself as a manifestation of his glory. So it's impossible to say that I take any part of the Bible seriously without thinking seriously about ethnic diversity. Now, the question of what that looks like in a local context varies, right? So, I mean, I've been to Japan. You know what's in Japan? A lot of Japanese people. <laughs> so you're not, you're not about to have a multi-ethnic church in Japan. It's not going to happen. And I've never been to Iowa, but I'm assuming there's a lot of white people in Iowa. <laughs> so places like that, it might, be, it might be difficult. But if you're in, a, in an area where there is significant demographic diversity, 
And the question isn't like whether you should, but why not? And so I do think that churches, in so much as they are in demographic areas where that's a viable possibility, then I think they should pursue it. But I also want to say that when you are an ethnic minority in a majority culture, sometimes the church is the only place where people of color are, are often in leadership. So I don't actually believe that every church needs to be multi-ethnic. I do think that it needs to be a black church or a Latino church or an Asian American church because otherwise they're going to be completely assimilated. And sometimes some of the places where kind of black culture flourishes um, are places where they still maintain some control of the institutions. And so I don't believe that black churches should necessarily go away, but I do think that churches in so much as they're able should pursue diversity in some way. So let's talk about the white dominant church. This is what this church is. And we talk about rec racial reconciliation. We're trying to think about diversity, but what does it mean for us as a majority culture church to welcome people in who don't look like us rather than just saying welcome. We've talked about the issue of microaggression at times here and how do we understand each other better. But as, a, as someone who's not from the majority culture, what is it that you need to experience in our kind of church to ex feel like you're welcome? Well, there's this, there's this um, I could never, I don't know why, I'm supposed to be a Bible scholar, but I can never get this parable right. But there's the parable in the Bible about um, the, soul, the the king who's about to go to war to make sure he has enough army to fight or he's going to like yep. get smashed. And what I want to say is before any church starts talking about, and this is actually good, I think every church should ask this question so they can find out the truth about themselves. They need to ask themselves, do they actually, are they actually committed to making this happen? Because the question of diversity actually poses, makes church, makes churches ask themselves fundamental questions. Is this really truly about Jesus or is it about my cultural comfort? Because if, if I'm not willing, to, and, and so like, I wanna say, just be honest. If you're saying I'm not willing to change in order to evangelize this group and I'm forcing them to come into my culture and accept it to be Christian, then just be honest and say that's what we're doing. Say as a church, we're not willing to change to be more diverse. We want everyone to change to come to us. So we're going to say, as a church, our target is to evangelize like white people in our city. They just say it. I mean, because <laughs> it's a hard thing to actually articulate. Nobody wants to say it, but just say it. Say, hey, you know what? I realize that we might have to change some things about what we, what we do as a church. And I don't want to do that. So I'm not going to do it. So then what are you, what, I mean, what are you actually saying? And what we're actually saying is that what we value most is our comfort. Mm -hmm. And I want to say that we, I want to say that's, we're, we're in a sad place in a church. I talk about beware the law of unintended consequences. Mm -hmm. So what I want to say is this, is that people of color, African-Americans in particular, have said for, I don't know, a hundred years that there's the race problem in America, 200 years, and in particular, if you go back to the 80s and the 90s, there was this huge emphasis on saying we need to pursue the issue of racial reconciliation very, very seriously. And for the most part, in majority white churches, we were ignored. And then 2016 happened, in the lead of 2016, and people said, oh man, I see it. And now you can feel it in the culture. You can feel it. And people say, when did the culture become like this? We said the culture's always been like this. Now, say, for example, 20 years ago or 10 years ago, a church had decided, you know what? As we read the scriptures, we feel like God is calling us to become a more diverse place. And so they took the numbers here, they took the money here, and they became that kind of congregation. And think what happens. They had started that in 2006. And then think of where they were when 2016 hit. They were already had done the emotional and spiritual work to make it happen. It's almost like, and, and I want to, once again, I'm not taking this lightly. It's like COVID-19, right? We're saying, okay, we know these are the precautions that you need to take. And if you don't take them, it's going to be exponentially worse. So deal with it now. What happened as it relates to race, um, racial injustice in America, the church did not take the call of people of color seriously. And now the virus is everywhere. Mm. And it's in the church. It's in the church yeah. and it's not just in the evangelical church. 
It's everywhere. It's everywhere. I mean, I have friends, I work at Wheaton College. I have friends at, at R1 institutions who are leaving those places that are, you know, these progressive, supposedly progressive havens. Why? Because of systemic racism. So it's not that it's like the evangelical fundamentalists who are doing everything that is horrible and kind of progressive culture is the utopia for black people. It's not. It's not. Right? I mean, sorry, can I, can I, am I allowed to talk about politics to your church? Can I talk about it? It's okay. I'm already here anyway. I won't say anything political. I want to make a, I want to make a point. Okay? okay. I'm not making a political advocacy. Okay. What I'm saying is you have one political party that values diversity and there's like no people of color who made it through the candidates process. Right? right. And so like, if you think about the two parties, right at the end, we ended up with like not, not very much diversity. So it's one thing to say we value diversity and we want to listen to the voices of people of color and women. When it actually comes time to make decisions, then who actually is in charge? And so, and all that to say is this, it's, it's to say that churches have to take seriously what the scripture says about who God values and ask themselves, are they willing to be obedient? So when we and talk- it costs something, And it costs something. So when we talk about reconciliation, what does reconciliation look like then? I think the reconciliation always begins with truth telling. Um, we tend to think of like, especially in our context, we, we talk about the excesses of both sides and then we find the middle. But the truth isn't always on the middle. Sometimes one group has done something wrong, another group has done something right. And so reconciliation first starts with like really coming to grips with what happened to people in this, in this culture, in this country, and owning our own complicity and our benefit from it and learning to, and even the church's own complicity in these things. The first thing we have to do is tell the truth. And out of that truth comes the opportunity of forgiveness and cooperation. Because what I think that, I think that what divides, at least, at least as it relates to the church, what divides at least black Christians, I can't speak for one of us, black Christians from white Christians, is often different readings of American history mm -hmm. and what happened here and the church's own complicity in it. So I would say first truth telling and then asking ourselves, what kind of changes do we have to make to be together? And then making those changes and recognizing that it might not be successful. Mm -hmm. So I'm mm -hmm. like, if, if you ever want someone to help you grow a church, like never invite me. <laughs> Because I'm not a sorry, I'm not a church. I'm not a church growth strategist. I don't tell you what is efficient. He's like, why did I invite him here? <laughs> I try to tell people what works. Yeah. I mean, I don't try to do what is work. I don't tell people what works. I try to say what's true. Yeah. And so, what's true is like faithfulness to the gospel means that like people have to confront their own sin, and people don't like that. And there's a lot of places that won't make you confront your own sin. So it's always easier to go there. But I can say, and I'm willing to be, be corrected, what does it seem like the Bible is calling us to? And how can we be faithful to those things? Mm -hmm. And that's what I try to do. I'm not an infallible interpreter, nobody is. But what I try to do is read the Bible and tell people what I think it says. Mm -hmm. And what I think it says is that the Bible calls us to truth, the Bible calls us to change, and then the Bible calls us to really begin to pursue relationships mm -hmm. um, because the black church exists in the United States because to be honest, white Christians didn't want us around. And so we're not gonna necessarily just wander back. It's gonna have to be some sense of, please come join us. We're willing to do what we can to make you, make you feel welcome here. Hmm. So there's a question coming in about um, ethnically diverse friendships and the role they play in developing both our sensitivity and our understanding. So. How important is it, do you think, to have deep friendships across ethnic lines? I think that those friendships um, are important, but I also think that like it's, it is incumbent, like in the year of our Lord 2020, where Google exists and books have been written, that it is, the relationship will go much better. And I can say this because like I live in a majority white setting and I have, white friends who I'm closer to and whom I keep my distance. And the people who I open myself up to 
are people who I know have already done some of the work of educating themselves. And they're not simply befriending me as mm -hmm. kind of their pedagogical like buddy, but out of the context of a deeper. And so I kind of feel like, oh, he or she has really thought about what it means to be black in this country. Mm -hmm. So like, I know, I'm a New Testament scholar. I know the development of theology in Germany. I can talk about the development of theology in the UK. I can talk about the development of theology in kind of mainline Protestantism. I can talk about all three of those things. And most of my colleagues can. Most of my colleagues can't tell you anything about the history and development of, of the black church tradition. And that limits our community. So they felt no need to learn about my context in order to do their work, but I know about their context. And the same thing. So like what I would want to say then is try to educate yourself on kind of the, at least the African-American perspective. And, and I'm saying it's one, at least African-American perspectives on issues by reading wildly. And when they, when people of color see that this friendship isn't utilitarian, if you've educated yourself, then you can be open. The other thing that I would say is this, and this is really, really, really important. And I don't know one's going to listen to me, but I tell everyone to do it anyway. If you want to understand how Black church and Black culture works, you actually have to visit those spaces. So, for example, you're inviting me into your church, right? So I'm in your space. So I'm engaging in the process of translation. I'm saying, well, what do I know of my culture that I can tell you in your playground? Now, if you wanted to hear how Black pastors talk, then you need to be in a room with 15 Black pastors. When the, there's not one Black pastor explaining things to you, but you're hearing how the conversation goes when African-Americans control the modes of discourse. And so what I want to say then is that people who really care about understanding the African-American Christian experience or the African-American experience more broadly need to put themselves in a situation where they're not in charge and their culture is not the center. Hmm. And that might involve like visiting a church. I mean, it's for me, it's easy. I just go to the black barbershops. It's like find black spaces and listen to black people talk yeah. <laughs> and just listen, right? I mean, I have, and, and maybe this is funny, but like as someone who is not native to kind of white culture, I can see it. Like I can see it because I'm not a part of it. I say, oh, I didn't know the white people did this. They seem to do this. Like, <laughs> and so what I'm saying is you need to understand black culture. Yeah. And black, it's almost like language immersion, right? You have to some, at some point immerse yourself in the language and find ways to do that. And sorry, I'm, I feel like I'm giving you all too many pointers. <laughs> but the thing I would say is like, that doesn't mean that you find poor people, right? Because we can think of like black equals poor, but like there's an entire black middle class that exists too. And so when I understand, when I say understand the diversity of, of black culture, is that black culture runs the gambit from the black bourgeoisie to the black, you know, the black middle class, the um, kind of black working class. And we think if I want to understand black culture, you tend to think I want to go to the hood and like get real blackness. Well, that's kind of, you know, that's racist. <laughs> Stop doing that. Yeah. So <laughs> what I want to say is like go to and, and or read or watch, tele, watch TV shows, mm. listen to black talk radio. So th there is often a perception that um, if you want to understand justice, if you want to understand uh, diversity and racial reconciliation, you have to go outside the church in the secular culture with people who are activists and that that's where the true uh, justice work is done. What, what role does Jesus actually play? How essential is knowing Jesus in order to getting justice done and coming to a place of reconciliation? Oh man, that's I wrote a whole chapter, basically a whole book about this. <laughs> well, well I, I can, I, how, how can I say this briefly? Okay, I'll say this. Um, when Jesus gave his first sermon, he he opens up Isaiah's scroll and he quotes. We won't even get into like the quote, but then he said, "Then these words are being fulfilled through you." And if you kind of go through Jesus's like ministry, you can see very very clearly that he draws upon the prophet, the prophetic tradition of the Old Testament, in particular, the book of Isaiah. Um, and so even Jesus goes, you know, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city, the stones to prophets and killed those sent to it. Often I wanted to gather you up as a hen gathers um, its chicks under its, its wing, but you were not willing. So he's saying, I'm a part of the traditions of the prophets that you killed. Okay. 
That raises the question. This is an important question. Hope they're listening. What did the prophets say in the Old Testament that got them into so much trouble? What did they say? Isaiah, woe to you who add house to house so there's no room left for the people in the land. Your bad housing, pro your bad housing policy. Woe to you who, 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 who corrupt justice in the court systems. Woe to you who, but then, so, 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 so you see in the prophetic tradition, a critique of Israel's systemic sins and oppression of the marginalized. That's the first thing. But he also says, woe to you who get up early in the morning to drink wine and run after iniquity and abandon the God of Israel. So in the prophetic tradition, you have both the critique of systemic sin the call to faithfulness to the one God of Israel and the critique of personal immorality. So Jesus says, I am the, I am the fulfillment of this tradition. So what does justice look like in a Christian context where Jesus in his own person is bringing together the entire prophetic tradition in his ministry? The Jesus' life is an exegetical, is an exegesis of the prophets. You see this idea that justice involves both systemic critique and personal transformation. And I'll say this is the reason why I put both those things together. I remember when I used to teach at Dartmouth College, I mean, I used to work at Dartmouth College, and I would see how, how students live very destructive lives. But in some sense, their economic well-being shielded them from some of the consequences of their mistakes. But, the, but that, that same kind of personal immorality in my context growing up could ruin someone's life. Like a, 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 a child at, the, at a young age makes it much less likely they go to college and, and kind of make it into the middle class. And so what I want to say is that like in the Christian context, personal morality and, and sexual ethics are actually part of what allows people to kind of move through life. And, and so what I want to say then is that in the Christian context, there isn't this clear bifurcation between justice, faithfulness to God, and personal transformation. And then once again, we pulled these things apart. Um, the, the great philosopher, um, Deion Sanders, <laughs> a former football player, said money is just a great amplifier, right? That if that it just reveals who you are. And this idea that if someone is poor, they're inherently kind of have this moral superiority. And you just give them money and they're gonna change. What's gonna prevent the poor person doing to the wealthy the same thing the wealthy did for them. It's a sense in which alongside economic transformation, we need to learn how to think and reason and be different people. And what the gospel offers to the justice movement is ethics hmm. beyond the transformation of social structures. So I don't want to say it's an either or, it's a both of those things that are united in the Christian tradition. Hmm. So a couple of questions come up, uh, going back to the topic we talked about just before this about things we can both learn from the black church, which I think there are a host of things, um, but also what's an example someone asked of a way a black church or a white church might read scripture differently? Okay, I, don't, I mean, I think read scripture differently. It, I feel like this is always prone to misunderstanding. I think the scripture has a meaning. I think that different cultures have different ways in which the scripture challenges them. So for example, you hear this idea of forgiveness, right? Forgiveness is a Christian concept. And that when you say you should give, forgive one another our sins, on one level, it's the same for everyone. But in America, when like the white church is the perpetrator of sin against black Christians, the white Christians benefit from this forgiveness, right? Yes, you should forgive us and move on from these things that were done. Now, the African-American is like struggling with this forgiveness because of the concrete nature of what happened, right? We're in the middle of Jim Crow in 1954. What does it mean for a black Christian to forgive a white Christian when there's hoses and dogs happening to them? So you see how they're having to wrestle with a particular, like not the truth of the text, but how this text received. And so what I wanna say then is that different cultures deal with different issues. Or when the Bible talks about um, this strong. I remember when I was a kid, I was growing up, and I used to preach against you know wealth all of the time. Like you know, the Bible says it's about the rich. And then I remember one day preaching. It's like, oh my goodness, I got money now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm I'm not the poor critiquing the rich. I got money. So now I got to say, instead of yelling at people with money, I'm the person who's yelled at. So now I got to talk about these texts differently. Not in the sense of explaining them away, but they hit me differently. 
And so what I want to say then is that there are ways in which um, the cultural experiences of different people cause, and, and we actually understand this intuitively. We just don't attribute it to ethnicity and race, right? We can say that, okay, how does this text speak to married people? How does this text speak to single people? How does this text speak to people who have bad relationships with their parents because of abuse? We understand that intuitively. We don't ask the question of, this is what thinking I don't have a culture. Ask someone who is white, male, and middle class, these used to have people defer to me, how is this affecting how I read this text? And what's the particular message that I need to hear from this text? Mm -hmm. And so I'm not saying that there's a magical black reading. I'm saying that black experiences inform our readings and it causes us to ask different questions yeah. and it, it causes different pressure points. Yeah. I wanna go back to uh, earlier conversation, slightly earlier, and ask the question, when you think about a progressive culture and conservative culture in America, what do they both get wrong about issues of race and justice? I think a conservative from a Christian, from a, this is this is a broad generalization. I think the conservative cultures are excessively individualistic as it relates to sin in particular, and that the solution is always interpersonal and rarely systemic. And so, there's a tendency to say, "Well, racism is a, per, a personal sin," and then it doesn't always attend to systems. And in the Bible, there is this idea of systems, right? The Bible talks about systems of oppression. And I mean, especially in the prophets, he talks about, so let me give you an, a really brief example. The king in Israel was the government, right? And the, and the kings of other nations were the government. They was not a democracy. And so when Old Testament prophets critique kings, those are governmental critiques. And when the prophets critique kings, for the oppression and exploitation of the poor, that is a systemic critique. There's no other way to talk about it. And it's not just a critique leveled, levied against Israel, it's a critique levied against other nations. In the New Testament, woe to you Babylon the Great, right? And, and, and God critiques Rome for economic policies in the book of Revelation. So that's one flaw, the, the inability to understand how systems affect people's lives. On the other side, I really think that progressives have way too much confidence, bordering on arrogance, in the sense of we know what the problem is, we've diagnosed the solution, and everyone needs to come on board and do it the way that we want to do it. Mm -hmm. And in that context, especially, ethnic minorities are often not agents they're a manifestation, I'm gonna sound really mean here. They're a manifestation of the ideal of diversity, not ages within progressive causes, right? So diversity is a value, but it's diversity on their terms. And with the consensus, that, so we decided what justice is, we decided what diversity is, and now you just guys, you come and join it. Instead of letting the people of color set the terms for the debate. And oftentimes the, the justice that exists is a justice that in some sense is impervious to critique. Hmm. And what I mean is the following. The scriptures themselves exist above a critique culture. And so they often push on social consensuses. And so in so much as you, you, you lose the scriptures ability to speak against a social consensus, then you're trusting in your own wisdom. Hmm. And so the question, and I, I often ask this to my progressive friends, who's allowed to critique you? Hmm. Who's allowed to challenge you? I know, I get it. The Bible is written by these patriarchal, sexist, horrible people. So you, you get rid of that. And like the conservatives are wrong. So you get rid of that. The actual people of color in your institution are largely wrong. So then I'm left with kind of like two to 3% of upper middle class white intellectualism telling me what to do. And I don't want either one of those groups telling me what to do. I'd rather try my best to listen to God. And so that may seem like overly harsh. Um, and only, and maybe it's, uh, it's only overly harsh is because sometimes the self-confidence, um, and this is my own, I got to work through this. Sometimes the self-confidence of that tradition really um, is tricky for me to deal with emotionally. Yeah. 
because uh, that's that's where I that's that's where I cut my teeth as a scholar, and I, I came up through that tradition. I didn't come up through kind of evangelical education. I came up through kind of a lot of people who are confident about what they needed. It, so, and I'll say, can I say this last thing? And, and this is this one. Maybe I should, I'll say it this way. The critique of fundamentalism, which I get, fine. Fundamentalism is the worst. Got it. <laughs> but some of the things they talk, some of the ways in which scripture is demeaned in progressive circles is indirectly really disrespectful to the black church. That also has a high view of scripture. And so the idea is often we need to kind of take the authority of scripture away so that we can then kind of free you know, the church of fundamentalism. But it was actually those same scriptures that allowed the black church to critique kind of systemic racism. And so in so much as you take the scriptures from me, you're taking the rock upon which, you know, the church is built. Not in the sense that it replaces Jesus, but we use these texts to critique kind of oppression in America. And so I'm very hesitant coming out of the African-American church tradition to dismiss the authority of scripture in a thick way and trust someone else's consensus because that never goes well for us yeah i want to shift the conversation again i happen to think that our conversations about race are dominated by our historic experience between black and whites how we've treated how white dominant culture has treated african americans and that has yeah. that affected how we understand all ethnicity but somebody's raised the question about what about asian americans in our culture where do they fit in this conversation? And they're often described as the model minority, quote unquote, whatever that means. And so as you think about yourself as a scholar, African-American scholar, a scholar of the New Testament, how do you engage that community in this conversation? So it's, I'm glad you asked that. I'm, I'm teaching a class now called the Bible and Theology in Color that gets at this exact issue because it is often the black white binary. And in the class, we take a selection of readings from the African-American church tradition, from the Latina tradition, from um, very, the Asian American tradition. And, and, and that speaks like, not like a monolith, I should say traditions. And the point is to understand the diversity of experience. So let me give you an example of how I'm learning. At the center of the African American church tradition are like these seven historic black churches that arose in the context of slavery to be, that stood at the center of the African American Christian tradition. So when I first started studying like the Latino, the Latino tradition, I started saying, well, Where's the seven historic Latino churches that, you know, are at the center of culture? And I didn't really understand how immigration and the conquest of the Southwest impacts Latino culture in the kind of back and forth migratory pattern. And so me looking at everything through the lens of kind of the black church, white church binary forced me to ask the wrong questions of what was going on in the immigrant experience and how that impacts how they do theology. And in the same way as it relates to Asian Americans. And so we don't have in the African American context, at least the American descendants of slaves, we don't have kind of this strong second and third generation tension that exists between people who immigrate and what it's like to kind of deal with pressures of assimilation and, and perpetual foreigner. And so what I want to say is that studying those traditions, even if that's what I was doing before I, before I logged on now, I was reading for one of those classes, um, for that class. It showed me how complex, and not only that, how rich it is. Like I am beginning to, I was being challenged to some of my own biases and blind spots by reading from Asian Americans. Even the example of the word Asian American. African American works a little bit because yeah. we've lost kind of our ethnic tribal identity because we were just kind of brought here. but. Asian American encompasses so many different ethnic groups, so many different cultures. I don't even know if, I mean, I get that it's a helpful term, but it's like Korea, Japan, um, Cambodia, oh Southeast Asia. Yeah. I, was, I, was, I, was, I was trying to think of when I moved to Japan and I, under, I began to see and feel the dynamics between Korea, um, China, and Japan. And that just gave me a whole new window into it. It's, it's also a lot in some ways. So anyways, I don't want to, I, was, I had to finish the thought. It is one of the reasons why I am not a huge fan of language like whiteness and like, because white, the white black binary is important in the United States, but it's not super helpful when you go to Asia. 
And so when we say whiteness is the problem, well, it's whiteness isn't the problem when it's a Korean Japanese conflict. So we need kind of theological language that I think is universal. It gets to kind of this human tendency to otherize people mm -hmm. and to um, make in, like faulty value judgments. And so at least in American context, whiteness language can sometimes function to kind of ontologize that particular evil in white culture. And I don't think it's the case. I think living in other places led me to believe, at least personally, this is one manifestation of a sin that repeats itself across all cultures. Yeah. We just have a few minutes left. And I'm not talking to too long. <laughs> Forgive me. No, no. This has been great. I just uh, wonder if you have one concluding thing that you'd like to say to our church community about the importance of engaging with Jesus over these issues. Yeah, I, I tell, you should probably tell them that I'm sorry that it's a pandemic, and so I'm tired. I've had kids all day, so if I was not as diplomatic as I should have been, please forgive me. I have four children. <laughs> Every, we've been locked in the house for five consecutive days. It's not. It's ten o'clock at night here, we and the later it gets, the, the later it gets, the more I suffer. But no, I would say, I would say this, and. I really wish that, that we could get to see each other so you all could at least get a, a feel for who I am. I am not um, pessimistic about the possibility of Black, White, Asian, Latino cooperation. I'm not pessimistic about like the white church because I believe that the resurrection is true and that raising dead people is really, really hard to do. And if God can raise dead people, then God can do just about anything. So I don't believe that like things like white, I'll put it this way, White supremacy is not more evil to defeat than death. Hmm. And so I'm not allowed as a Christian to ever be hopeless. So I do hope that we can, like, and I, not only do I hope, I will spend my life working for this cooperation. I think that's what the Bible says the church is. And I don't expect everybody to agree with me and every church to change, but I think enough of them can. And I think in so much as churches do, they begin to say, this is something that God values and I'm going to value it then it becomes a, a reflection of what God is doing in the world. Because we've tried everything else, like our politics leave us divided, right? Our, but, but you know, every king, every ruler, every government has said, we can fix it and they can't. And I'm confident that the one thing that unites us across difference hmm. is the gospel and the blood of Jesus. I mean, where are you from? Me? Yeah, you. you. I'm from California. You from? California. Yeah, I'm from Alabama. Why would a black guy from Alabama <laughs> and some guy from California be quick, fast friends? <laughs> That's a good question. <laughs> yeah. It's Why am I talking to you, right? Yeah. This is a manifestation of the power of the gospel, is That's what I'm right. trying to say. That's right. And it's what gives me hope. And so what I want to say to people in your churches, don't lose hope. Keep reading the scriptures and do the best that you can. I mean, and... and, and what I want to say about that is like, and I mean, this is people fail at stuff all the time. Like, so you, you have a, a church, a fundraising plan or an evangelistic plan or a youth ministry plan and it fails and you say, okay, let's find a new way to do youth ministry better. And what I tend to see happen is that because race is so emotionally charged, church try, church will try one time and if it doesn't work, they kind of give up. It's like, but it's like anything else. You're not going to say everything right. You're not going to do everything right. And you're going to mess up. It's okay. You know why? Because God forgives you. Mm. Shake the dust, you know, shake yourself off, figure out what didn't work, improve it and keep trying on again. And even if it never works, even if it never works, you can at least go to sleep at night saying we tried Amen. as best Amen. as we could to incarnate the gospel in our local place. And like God's beat in that effort. That's fantastic. Well, we are now out of time. We want to welcome, uh, thank, thank you all of you who are watching. Thank you, Dr. Bacali, for this great hour. We had a wonderful time together. Thank you, folks, for watching. We hope you had a great time, and we hope that we'll be able to visit with Dr. Bacali in person next year when we don't have COVID-19. Thank you, everyone. Yeah, hopefully, hopefully I didn't say anything that makes them never want to invite <laughs> me again. That's not going to be a problem. Thank you. All right. I'll talk to you later. Bye.